In this video, we're going to focus on the Gospels. Now, almost everything that you want to know about the life and ministry of Jesus, you can find in the four Gospels. And the four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the Gospels existed first in the oral tradition in the new Christian communities before it was eventually written down for us. Now, the question is, what is the Gospel? Now, the word Gospel literally means good news. And that word occurs more than 90 times in the Bible and then exclusively in the New Testament. Now, interesting, the English word Gospel is derived from an Anglo-Saxon word, God spell. Now, it is a combination of two words, God, which means good, and spell means news, good news. This is where the English word gospel is derived from, from the Anglo-Saxon word God spell, which means good news, to translate the Greek word for good news. And that brings us to the next question. Why do we have four gospels? While well, Oregon, he was an ancient Christian writer. He actually gave us a very interesting answer to this question. He said, we don't have four gospels but we have one fourfold gospel because he said each gospel they give us a different perspective on the life of Jesus and we need all four perspectives to get a full picture of Jesus. So according to Oregon it is one gospel but it is one fourfold gospel. So we don't have four gospels but we have different perspectives on the life and ministry of Jesus just to give us a full picture. Now Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they wrote their Gospels from four different viewpoints and it was also addressed to four different audiences. So let us look at the audiences. Now Matthew was written for a Jewish audience to show the connection between Jesus and the Old Testament. Mark was written for a Roman audience who had not been eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus Christ. Now Luke was written for a Greek audience because he wanted to prove that the story of Jesus is true. And Luke was a non-Jew, he was from the Greek speaking world as well. And John was written for a universal audience in a time where theological debate and heresies were becoming rampant. So they all had a different audience, a different focus. Now each of the Gospels emphasizes a different origin of Jesus. Now Matthew shows that Jesus came from Abram through David and demonstrate that he is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. Mark shows that Jesus came from Nazareth, demonstrating that Jesus is a servant because Nazareth was not a very prominent place. Luke shows that Jesus came from Adam, demonstrating that Jesus is the perfect man, he's the perfect human being. John shows that Jesus came from heaven, demonstrating that Jesus is God. So it's very interesting to see how they depict the different origins of Jesus. And all four of these origins are actually correct, that Jesus is from Abram, Jesus is from Adam, he came from Nazareth, and he's also from heaven. So it's actually amazing that they have these four different views of Jesus. Now the Gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as the Synoptic Gospels. Why? Because they are strikingly similar. They work together with a common view and this is what the word synopsis mean. It means common view. And Matthew, Mark and Luke have a common view on the life of Jesus Christ. It is completely in contrast with the contents of John. The first three Gospels focus more on what Jesus taught and did. John focuses more on who Jesus is. Now the Gospel of John is so unique that 90% of the contents in John you will not find in the first three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, because they have a common view. They are called the Synoptic Gospels, but John is completely different than the other Gospels. And I have a list of unique material 
in the book of John that you will not find in the other Gospels. For example, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, you only find that in John. The woman at the well, turning water to wine, healing the crippled man at the pool of Siloam. And the rest of all the other information you will only find in the book of John. So it is completely different than the first three Gospels. Now, each of the four Gospels presents a unique view of Jesus, drawn from different eyewitnesses and different traditions. And we are fortunate to have these four windows to see four views on the life and ministry of Jesus. Because we need to be realistic, the life and ministry of Jesus had such a huge impact that it was impossible for one author to contain everything for us. So we are very fortunate that we have these four windows, these four different perspectives on the life and ministry of Jesus. Then on page 195, we look at the historical context. That's the background. Now, the gospel will be best understood if you have an awareness of both the culture and the religion of those days when Jesus actually ministered in that part of the world. Now, if we look at the historical context of Jesus, we have a few points there. The first one, Israel was on the dominion of the cruel Roman Empire. So it was a very tough time for the Jewish people because the Roman Empire made it very difficult for them. Now, the Jews were constantly rebelling and it often resulted in the slaughter of many by the Romans. So they did not like the Roman authority and the Roman rule and they rebelled against that and many of them were killed as a result. And then the next point, Jewish religious leaders had imposed legalistic laws on the Jewish citizens and eventually all those laws, those legalistic laws, it actually weighed them down. Because all those laws were meant to help them to preserve their religion and their culture, but it was just too many laws and it really weighed them down. And then the next point, there was a great expectation among the Jews for a coming Messiah to free them from Roman oppression. Now we need to know that the time difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is 400 years. And after the 400 years silence, we call those years the silent years because there was no prophet speaking to God's people on behalf of God. So that is why we call the time frame between the Old and New Testament the silent years, no prophecy. And then Jesus was born and Jesus cried when he was a baby, actually broke the 400 years of silence. And then they thought, wow, maybe this is the Messiah because he performed miracles and he actually taught with authority. But the next point says that there was an unfortunate reality. And that reality was that, that not many recognized Jesus as the Messiah because their expectations and the plan of God did not have much in common. They wanted someone to free them from oppression, but God's plan was to send Jesus to show the love of God to the world and to save the world. Let us have a look at the author's reasons for writing the Gospels. Now, Matthew's Gospel is especially interested in portraying Jesus as the Messiah, the Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled in him, because he wrote for a Jewish audience and for them the idea of a Messiah was very important. Mark's Gospel is interested in describing Jesus as the Son of God, but who paradoxically must suffer as the servant of God. Now Luke's Gospel is interested in describing Jesus as the Son of God, but he places an emphasis on Jesus as the Redeemer of all people. Because Luke was a Gentile and he wanted to connect the message of Jesus to a wider audience. John's Gospel makes its purpose very clear. And there's one beautiful verse that will capture the purpose of John. And that is John 20 verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life 
in his name. Now on page 197, we're going to look at the genre of Gospels, that is the type of literature, and it is basically narrative. But we also have embedded genres like conversation, where Jesus had many conversations with people. You have dramatic history like the birth of Jesus Christ. You have metaphors, allegory, simile. And then, of course, we have the parables of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus told more than 40 parables. And two of the most well-known parables are the parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the good Samaritan. Even people who don't go to church, who don't even know the Bible, they are definitely aware of those two parables. The parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the good Samaritan. Now, what is a parable? Now, the Greek word paraboli means a placing of one thing beside another. So it's a side by side comparison. Now, Jesus' parables, they were stories that were a placing of one thing beside another. Why? It was to illustrate a truth. Like in the parable of the prodigal son, the forgiving father is the perfect picture of God. The younger son symbolizes the tax collectors and the sinners. And the elder brother, he represents the self-righteous Pharisees. So one can see it's placing one thing beside something else. Now, a common description of a parable is that it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, Jesus' parables are recorded for us in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. Now, you can ask, but what about John? But did you know that there are no parables in the Gospel of John. You don't find any parables in John's Gospel, only in Matthew, Mark and Luke. On page 198, we are going to look at guidelines to understand parables. I have six guidelines there for us. The first one is understand the nature of parables, and that's very important. Parables are tools, tools to compare something physical, something you can see, to something spiritual, something that's abstract, something that you cannot see. That's why Jesus many times when he will start a parable, he will say the kingdom of God, which is abstract, you cannot see it, it's spiritual. No, the kingdom of God is like, and then Jesus will tell a parable. And in one of the parables, he said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It is concrete. So he used concrete examples to share something about a spiritual truth, something that you cannot see. And then number two, determine the context of the parables. Now, often times a parable had a brief introduction and in the introduction, you many times will find the context of a parable. For example, in Luke chapter 18, verse one, it says the following. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So that was the context of that parable. And then we have the parable of the prodigal son. That will be our focus in this week. The parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And when you read Luke 15 verses 1 and 2, you will see the context of that parable when you read verses 1 and 2. And then number three. Don't treat parables like allegory because allegory is completely, almost completely filled with symbolic meanings where every little detail means something. You cannot read a parable like that because the next point will tell us why not. And that is point number four. Parables usually have one main point because if you read a parable like an allegory, you will get lost in the detail because a parable actually wants to convey one main point because there was a reason why Jesus told parables. He wanted to illustrate one specific point. And then number five, the ending of parables is very important. Like if we focus on the parable of the Good Samaritan, when you read the ending of that parable, it will help you to get a better understanding of that parable. And I would like to read for you 
Luke 10 verses 36 and 37. That's the ending of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And those two verses will help you to get a better understanding of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. So you see the last two verses of this parable really helps us to get a better understanding of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then our last point, number six, is code words and phrases. The first one I want to show you the code word or phrase that Jesus liked to use. It is how much more. And I would like to read for you an example from Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So this is what Jesus liked to use. How much more? And the reason why Jesus did that was to build a bridge from a temporal thing to a spiritual reality. To tell them that human beings are way more valuable than sheep. And if you can help sheep out of trouble on a Sabbath, how much more do you need to help human beings when they are in trouble on a Sabbath? So that is why Jesus said it's not wrong to do good things on a Sabbath. And then the second phrase, he who has ears to hear. And I have a few verses there where you get that. He who has ears to hear calls people to critically important issues. And then the third one, Jesus used the phrase, very truly I tell you. And I have a verse there for you. It means that Jesus is speaking with earnest intensity. So when you read the parables, you can look out for these phrases because there's a reason why Jesus would use those phrases. On page 201, we're going to look at a few key concepts in the Gospels. The first one is Messiah. Now, Messiah is a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. Now, Messiah has a Greek equivalent because we need to know that the Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. So the Greek word for Messiah is Christos. And this is where we get our English word Christ. And Christ means the anointed one. So the equivalent for Christ is Messiah. Christ is from the Greek word Christos and Messiah is the Hebrew word. And they mean exactly the same, the anointed one. Now the Jewish expectations was very nationalistic and linking the Messiah strongly to the house of David. So they wanted to have a national hero to free them from oppression and to make the Jewish nation a very, very strong nation. And God did not have that in mind for the Messiah. And then the second one, the second key concept is the suffering servant. Now the Old Testament refers to a suffering servant who has long been understood by the historical rabbis of Judaism to speak of the Redeemer who will one day come to Zion. Through Jesus' suffering, and this is important, He takes the task of the suffering servant, but not the title. So He took the task because Jesus really suffered a lot, but He was never called the suffering servant. It was never a title for Jesus. The next one is Son of God, and this is very interesting. You now, the term Son of God occurs more than 40 times in the Bible, and all of them in the New Testament. Now, to say that Jesus is the Son of God means that Jesus is from God. It is like a title. He is from God. Now, I many times will tell people it's not that difficult to explain because I'm a son of Africa. I grew up in Cape Town, so I'm a son of Africa. That means I am from Africa. If you are a son of the Nile, you are from Egypt. And that means that you are from that place, that you belong there, that you won 
with that place. So when we say that Jesus is the Son of God, it didn't mean that God had a mother and the baby was born. It doesn't mean that. It just means that Jesus is from God. And then Christianity, the title Son of God, refers to the status of Jesus as the divine Son of God the Father, as the second person in the Trinity. So it was the status of Jesus. And in the Old Testament, this concept of the Son of God, it was used for nations, it was used for kings, and it was also used for the Messiah. Sometimes kings will be called, we are sons of God. Nations will be called sons of God, and even the Messiah. But in the New Testament, this Son of God was closely linked to the Messiah. Now, Jesus was very conscious of His intimate relationship with God the Father. He was very aware of that, that He was indeed the Son of God, that He was from God. Now, on page 202, we get our next key concept, that's the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is a title that was used exclusively by Jesus. His disciples never addressed Him as the Son of Man. Thomas would say after Jesus' resurrection, my Lord and my God, but they never addressed Him as the Son of Man. Now, the Gospels record more than 80 times that Jesus used this title for Himself. That's a lot, more than 80 times. Now, the Son of Man was the primary title that Jesus used to describe Himself during His ministry in this world. So, the Son of Man is a very important title. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us definitely why Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. We just don't know exactly why. But what we do know is that the Son of Man was used in a variety of ways. Jesus used that title in a variety of ways. But what we do know is that Jesus used this term, Son of Man, in a variety of ways. He used it in the context of His present ministry, His earthly work. And I have a verse there to explain that. Luke 9, verse 58. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. So it was used in his present ministry. And then number two, it was used in the context of his coming suffering. And I have a verse there for us, Mark 8 verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So it was in the context of his present suffering. And it was thirdly in the context of his future coming, his second coming in heavenly glory. And I have a verse there for us, Mark 8 verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. We can see he's using the Son of Man in the context of his second coming. Now, Son of Man was used to say what Jesus did rather than what he was. That's very important. It was used to tell what Jesus did rather than what he was. It was not and did not become a title in the normal sense, at least not on the lips of Jesus. Then on page 203, we get our last key concept, that is the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is very important because it was the central message of Jesus. And I have six reasons why we say that the kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus. The first reason, His teaching was designed to show people how they might enter the kingdom of God. So when Jesus taught people, He wanted them to understand how they could enter His kingdom. When He talked to Nicodemus, He said to Nicodemus in John 3 that you need to be born again to enter God's kingdom. So His teaching's focus was to tell people how to enter His kingdom. Number two, His mighty work were intended to prove that the kingdom of God had come upon them. So his mighty work was all focused on his kingdom. Number three, 
His parables illustrated to the disciples the truth about the kingdom of God. So many of his parables, Jesus start with the following line. He said, the kingdom of God is like, then he will tell a parable. Number four, he taught his followers to pray and at the heart of their petition were the words, let thy kingdom come. God wanted his kingdom to come. Let thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number five, on the eve of his death, he assured his disciples that he would yet share with them the happiness and the fellowship of the kingdom. So at the very last moment of his life, he focused on the kingdom. And number six, he promised that he would appear again on earth. He will come again in glory to bring the blessedness of the kingdom to those for whom it was prepared. So for Jesus, it was all about his kingdom because it's the kingdom of love, joy and happiness. God wanted people to be part of that. Now, the term kingdom of God occurs four times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, 32 times in Luke, two times in the Gospel of John, six times in Acts, eight times used by Paul, and it occurs once in Revelation. But it's interesting, Matthew actually prefers the term kingdom of heaven, but it means the same, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, and it was used over 20 times in his Gospel. So we see about 77 times you get the word kingdom in the New Testament because it was the key concept of the life of Jesus and his ministry. So I have a brief definition of the kingdom. Now, broadly speaking, the kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal sovereign God over the entire universe. God is sovereign. He rules. That is his kingdom. And when we pray, let thy kingdom come, it is to get everyone to acknowledge wherever they are, this is God's kingdom. Everything belongs to God, but it's not always acknowledged. But when we pray, let thy kingdom come, it is to acknowledge that where we are and what we do, it is part of God's kingdom. Now, I trust that this video was helpful to give you a better understanding of the Gospels, how amazing it actually is that we have one foretold Gospels, four perspectives, four windows, because it was impossible for one person to capture the life and ministry of the greatest movement leader of all time, Jesus Christ. I trust this video will motivate you to read the Gospels and to be overwhelmed by the good news, because this is what Gospel means. It means the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need to take this good news into the whole wide world. Thank you.